Hey everybody and welcome to the first HSE revision lecture for chemistry. Um, in this video we'll be looking at production of materials. I'll also be releasing videos on the other two core topics, the acidic environment and chemical monitoring and management, as well as a fourth video going through general study techniques for chemistry and ways to approach the final HSE exam. We're releasing these videos for a whole range of subjects, so make sure to keep an eye out for them. Um, and these videos are going to be quite short, probably about 15 minutes, which means that we can't go through every little piece of content. If you are finding yourself struggling through particular dot points and really need that extra help, we do sell um, course notes on atarnotes.com for $25, so check them out. You can also always ask as many questions as you want totally free at atarnotes.com, so make sure you're utilizing that resource as you gear towards the final HSE exam. So let's get started on production of materials. So we start off with the whole ethene and ethylene sort of stuff. I've kind of synthesized it into um, this list here, the reactivity, cracking, polymerization, and then polyethylene. Um, I think it's really helpful to kind of summarize things like this by topic rather than necessarily the order of the dot points. So we've got ethene at the top right there. We've got a little double bonded carbon with some hydrogens around it. Now it's very reactive. We know that. And the reason that it's very reactive is, is it has a double bond. It's important that you recognize that double bonds make a substance quite reactive because the bond can sort of flip out the other side and try and react with something else. And that explains why ethene and ethylene is quite reactive. Then we look at cracking. There are two methods of cracking. Um, cracking is just going from a long carbon chain to shorter char carbon chains. There's the brute force technique, which is thermal cracking. Um, this is done at about 700 to 900 degrees, and the things just smash apart. Now, it's important, I personally think it's important to have statistics like 700 to 900 degrees, not just because it's a great way to compare thermal cracking and catalytic cracking, but also in a format question about cracking, it is kind of hard to stand out from the crowd. So maybe you'd want to draw the diagram that's on the slide. Maybe you want to include a statistic about temperature. Whatever you want to do, it's really important to include detail that makes you stand out. Catalytic cracking, on the other hand, can be done at lower temperatures, specifically about 500 degrees. This is better because it's just more economic. It means that we don't have to maintain such high temperatures, so it's both safer and cheaper to run. Um, but catalytic cracking works in the presence of a zeolite catalyst, which is an aluminium silicate, which you can see on the slide. Again, you don't need to understand specifically what this means or why we use an aluminium silicate to um, lower the activation energy. But if you can throw those words in there, you will seriously be much more likely to receive full marks in a long response question. Then we looked at polymerization. Polymer polymerization has three steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. Uh, it's really important that you understand these by now. They're quite self-explanatory. Um, personally, I learned the equations that are, <clears throat> that are on the slide, so I would recommend you do so as well. Again, just because you need all of this detail to get full marks in questions, particularly on production of materials where students find that it's like typically quite easy. Um, you've done it for, for almost a year now. It's important not to forget that you'll still be assessed on it quite a lot. So whilst, yeah, it may be easy, yeah, you might may be used to it, now is the time to really nail down those additional details to make sure that you get full marks. Finally, we look at polyethylene. There are two kinds of polyethylene. There's high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene. Um, you can see the little images there. Again, if you get a question on it, there's no reason not to draw the pictures that I've got there. High density polyethylene is very linear. There's no side branching, which means that the different branches can get really, really close together. Whereas low density polyethylene has a lot of side branching, which makes it harder for the different strands to become compact. Uh, you need to know the uses. So low density is used for things like plastic bag, insulation. Um, high density is used for things like bowls, buckets, containers. Um, this is all in the course notes if you do need um, extra information, but otherwise feel free to pause the slide, take notes, ask questions on ATAR notes, watch the video as many times as you want, um, and hopefully you get something out of it. Great, so then we move on to biomass and ethanol and all that rubbish. Absolutely hate it. I'm sure you're completely tired of it by now, but we're just going to quickly smash through it. So first of all, you need to be able to draw cellulose. You can see on the slide that this is cellulose. It continues off to both sides. You need to be able to draw at least three um, glucose monomers to show cellulose. So exactly what's on the slide you need to know. The CH2OH groups have to switch sides 
the O should, the oxygen that joins the two groups should go up from up to down. Uh, you just need to memorize this. Forget the like solid lines bits that just shows like in and out of the page. You don't need to know that, but exactly what else, what is on the slide, you need to be able to draw. Then you can discuss some specifics. I mean, there's a lot of questions that say like, as you know, blah, 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 assess the use, the potential of biomass to replace fossil fuels. Blah, blah. The reason it's useful, which students often forget, is that there are lots of carbon chains within this biomass structure that we're looking at, and we can extract those carbon chains to form ethylene. Another reason that this is extremely, extremely useful is because the cellulose that you see here, seven times 10 to the 11 tons of it is produced each year. That's a fantastic statistic to go towards sustainability. Seven times 10 to the 11 tons are produced each year. I would definitely recommend using that statistic. Okay, so then we have the whole production of production of ethanol and polyethylene dot point. We start with cellulose, we crack it. We, we, I, I don't think cracking is quite the right word, but it does get across what you're talking about. We go from a long chain to a short chain to form glucose, which we ferment into ethanol, which we can dehydrate into ethene, which we can polymerize into polyethylene. I think having it in a um, diagrammatic form like this is extremely helpful to your understanding. If you can really, really nail down the different forms and the different steps to get between the forms in your mind, then you'll be much more likely to get full marks in a question in an HSC exam. And you will almost certainly get a question, if not several questions on this exact flowchart. Yeah, so you really hate ethanol by now, I know, but you still need to keep answering these questions because if you forget to answer these questions while you study because you're just tired of it, then in the HSC you risk getting a 6 out of 8 or even a 5 out of 8 instead of the 8 out of 8 that you deserve. So make sure to keep answering these questions, make sure to keep improving it as you go along. Okay, so now let's look at each of those steps in a bit more detail. We start off with the cellulose to glucose step. So as an example, we can grow sugarcane sugar cane to extract the biomass. Now, a step that students often forget is that when the sugarcane is in a sugarcane form, there's not much we can do with it. So we have to start off by grinding it up and extracting the cellulose itself. Um, a really great statistic, like I've already said, is that it's very, very renewable. We can grow 7 times 10, that should be an 11. 7 times 10 to the 11 tons, not 7 times 10 to the 7 tons. Um, cellulose makes up about 50% of plant matter. Note that these things, I mean, in, in, a, in a step that's not very, there's not very much to talk about, I've found additional statistics to really drive the point home. And you should be doing that as well. If you see a dot point and you know that a four or an eight mark question could be asked on it, but you don't have that much information, you should be seeking out information because the markers, the markers want a reason to give you marks. So if you impress them, by giving them statistics and extra detail, you are more likely to get those marks. Now, when it comes to the, the quote unquote cracking process, we know that it's expensive and time consuming, and it's done using either hydrolysis or enzyme digestion. Now, again, you don't need to understand how any of that works. I'm not a biologist. So I have no idea how enzymes work, but you need to be able to say it. You need to be able to say the issues with it, which is that it's expensive and time consuming. Um, because when you are assessing the viability of the production process, you would say, well, this step is not particularly great because it's expensive and time consuming. Now let's look at the glucose to ethanol step. That's just fermentation. I've seen five mark questions where it says, describe the conditions in which fermentation occurs to form ethanol from glucose. Five marks. That means you needed at least five things. On the slide, there are six. I would recommend just learning all of them. You should probably know them because you did the practical task. So fermentation should be done in pH neutral water, low oxygen concentration because yeast um, digests anaerobically. You need the yeast itself. You need some sort of nutrient, i.e. glucose. The alcohol concentration has to be less than 15% or the yeast dies. And you want warm temperatures, about 37 degrees. Um, when you're talking about a chemical process like fermentation, you would be losing marks. You would just be making your life difficult if you didn't write out that chemical equation. So you should absolutely be writing the chemical equation at the bottom, which is the fermentation of glucose into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Hopefully by now you just know that equation off by heart. It's one to two to two. If not, you can always balance the equation because by now you definitely know the chemical equation for glucose. For ethanol and for carbon dioxide. 
But again, I will talk about this in the techniques video, which will be our fourth video. You need to be including chemical equations wherever physically possible. So there is an extra step that wasn't in the flowchart, which is the ethanol to ethanol step. Remember that when we ferment the ethanol, there's a maximum concentration of 15%. And that's because the yeast dies at concentrations above 15%. So we use fractional distillation to extract the ethanol and purify it. We can use fractional distillation a number of times, which exploits the fact that ethanol has a specific boiling point and therefore will, um, since it's an alcohol, the boiling point's quite low. And so you can boil it, extract that particular fraction, and then do that a few times to get pure ethanol. Just to summarize the ethanol, well, I suppose the cellulose to ethanol slash ethene um, process, here is some information in a flowchart form that explains what goes on. When you're actually answering a question like this, don't be afraid to use a flowchart. I definitely did. I would have a flowchart similar to this, but down the page, where I would write just the name of the step, and then next to it, I would write all of the relevant details. So almost exactly like what you see on the slide. Um, it made the marker understand perfectly what I was trying to say, that I had not missed anything, that I had sufficient detail. Um, you could also do the same thing by just having subheadings. You could subheading cellulose, subheading glucose. I think a flowchart for this particular dot point makes life a bit easier for everybody involved, but that's a, that's a personal decision. That's totally up to you. Okay, so then we move on to redox reactions. Hopefully by now you know oil rig, oxidation it loses, reduction it gains. So as an example on the left, we have barium ions turning to barium solid. That means it's gaining electrons, so it's reducing. On the right, we've got barium solid going to barium ions, which means it's losing electrons, which means it's oxidizing. We can also use our oxidation numbers to get to the same result. The oxidation number on the left goes down, so it's reducing. The oxidation number is reducing. And on the right, the oxidation number is going up, which means it is oxidizing. Here's our standard galvanic cell. You need to be able to draw it. You need to be able to state what each part does, make sure to include the salt bridge. I think it's helpful to write potassium nitrate as the salt bridge because it almost always is potassium nitrate. Um, you need to know that the anode oxidizes and the cathode reduces. You can know that. And the typical mnemonic is anox and red cat. That's all we have for galvanic cells. The rest is pretty easy. You just need to be able to use that table of standard potentials, draw your galvanic cell, and draw out your half equations. Finally, we look at nuclear chemistry. Um, there are three reasons why an isotope may be, may be unstable. That's because the neutron to proton ratio is too high, in which beta negative decay occurs. Neutron to proton ratio is too low, in which beta positive decay occurs. Or there are just too many nucleons, in which alpha decay occurs. You can look at the graph at the bottom there. Um, if it's in the top region of the graph, it's the first, bottom region, it's the second, and the third one just means the thing's too bloody big. It's just too big and it doesn't want to survive. So it's important that you know these three, at least to a very minor level, and perhaps even have examples for each. So in the course notes that we've got online, I've got examples of each of these, and from memory, I did include that in my final HSC exam. Um, whether that's necessary or whether I just went over the top, that's up to you guys to decide. And then we have to actually produce these isotopes. Um, we use that for medical purposes and for industrial purposes, which you'll be very, very familiar with. Hopefully you've got your own isotopes by now with all the relevant details so you can answer a six mark question on it. In terms of actual production, we can either produce nuclear isotopes in a cyclotron, which accelerates charged particles really, really fast and smashes it into a new element um, to create some sort of isotope and hope for the best. Um, a nuclear reactor is when we smash just billions of neutrons into an element, hoping some of them stick, and this creates a heavier element. And that's all of production of materials. Thanks for listening, guys. That is, I think, the very, the, at least the majority of the content, if not almost all of it. Um, if you've got any questions, make sure to go to ATAR Notes. If you need a more comprehensive explanation, check out the course notes at ATARNotes.com. Um, We'll be releasing several more videos on chemistry as well as for a, just a huge range of subjects. Hopefully you're finding these videos useful. Hopefully you're taking notes. Make sure to share them with your friends um, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.